After its abrupt cancellation in 2020 amid the rampaging global pandemic, the Electronic Entertainment Expo, E3 for short, finally returns. For many, many years, the convention was considered a landmark time for gaming news. Almost every summer, the industry absolutely erupted with earth-shattering reveals, shocking announcements, and memorable moments. But within the last several years, many people have begun to wonder about its actual relevancy. Did we really need to migrate every piece of news to this one week in June, possibly sapping the surrounding weeks dry of anything eventful and causing a potential news drought before and after it? And what about smaller or individual companies who aren't at E3 who might get lost in the storm kicked up by the platform holders who are taking the spotlight that's being gleefully shined on them from every major publication? A lot of discussion was being had about whether or not we're just better off dismantling the expo and letting publishers and platform holders give their own shows whenever they damn well please. At the time, this was only a discussion, until last year's pandemic hits, which, very suddenly and forcefully, turned it into a reality. Instead of the usual one dense week stuffed to the brim with news, we got many separate events scattered throughout the summer. But after that reluctant year off, E3 has come back. This time as a digital event because, well, the pandemic is still going on and we can't have tens of thousands of people from dozens of different countries crammed into one convention center for a whole week. In terms of structure, E3 2021 was more or less indistinguishable from normal E3s on the spectator side. For us at home, we were still tuning in to different shows or press conferences scheduled over the weekend like always. The only real difference is that they weren't set in big auditoriums where you could hear a crowd react to what was being shown. Admittedly, I do kinda miss that aspect of in-person E3s, but otherwise this was the same old same old. Which is a good thing because it means it was a successfully seamless transition to a digital-only format. That much is great, but there's still the question of how good was the actual content of the event. And that, my friends, is a whole different ballgame. Before we dive into the review of the event, I should mention that I did not watch every single show of E3. I mainly just tuned into showcases from publishers and platform holders who have confirmed that they'll feature new game announcements. Day 1 of E3 started off with nothing too unexpected. First a Ubisoft show at the top of the afternoon, then Gearbox soon after. Sounds simple enough. Ubisoft maintains its reputation of painfully average shows with only splices of interesting stuff here and there. They opened with a fairly deep dive into Rainbow Six Extraction, which I think does look pretty fun, but nothing I'd write home about. And halfway in, there was a reveal of Far Cry 6 DLC that will let you play as the villains of past games. Specifically Voss from 3, Pagan Min from 4, and Joseph Seed from 5. Then the showcase closed with the reveal of Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, based on the James Cameron movies, which didn't land very well because it's easy to forget that the first one existed at all and that there's a follow-up trilogy coming up. Ubisoft was probably hoping this reveal would set the world on fire, but it ended up falling kind of flat, because no one cares that much about Avatar and the only ones who do are the weirdos who pop up out of nowhere and get strangely pissed off when you say that. Then Gearbox's show happened, and god almighty was it just awful. I saw people arguing about whether Capcom or Square Enix had the worst show, and I'll get to them in a minute, but they clearly didn't see Gearbox's. Or they did, and immediately forgot about it because there's nothing else your brain can do with information it doesn't wish to retain or see the need for. It was just Randy Pitchford's sweaty face telling everyone how cool the Borderlands movie will be, followed by news of games that honestly don't seem that interesting or have already failed. And tiny little dick teases of Homeworld 3, which does look interesting, but it's so early in development that they have nothing to really show. A total waste of time. Amusingly, the best show of day one goes to Devolver Digital, who had a lot to actually give us, and they're technically not even part of E3, if memory serves correctly. Shadow Warrior 3 looks cool, Trek to Yomi looks cool, Phantom Abyss, Death Door, Inscription, they all look really promising. Can't say the same for the other two seemingly big publishers who also had shows the same day. Day 2 of E3 started off on a better note with Xbox and Bethesda's hefty 90-minute event. 
It opened up with the formal reveal of Starfield, then a look at Stalker 2, the announcement of Avalanche's new game Contraband, and it maintained a fairly consistent pace from there on. It was a huge improvement over yesterday's shows, but still not perfect, as there were some key absences that some people were probably hoping for, such as something on Avowed or Fable. Sadly, they, along with others, weren't here, and I can understand why. They're likely nowhere close to being done. But we still got the announcement of The Outer Worlds 2, Age of Empires 4, and a deep dive into Forza Horizon 5, so I consider it a solid showcase overall. Unfortunately, the wind was taken out of Starfield's sails mere minutes prior to the show airing because Washington Post blew their load and uploaded the teaser too early. That's just how it goes sometimes. Square Enix's show was after that, and my god what a fucking weird one this was. It was confirmed ahead of time to be around 40 minutes long, and I knew we were in for a bad time when the Guardians of the Galaxy reveal ended up taking half of those minutes. It's a really lackluster announcement of a supposedly big game when you're staring at the clock wondering when the reveal is going to be over. It doesn't look like a super terrible game either, but people are probably very wary of Square's Marvel games after The Avengers, which is a bad thing because I'm sure Square is pretty desperate to maintain a positive relationship with the mouse. One of the few things I actually cared about in the show is Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster, which is a collection of the first six mainline Final Fantasy games remastered with pixel art styles but they are only confirmed for Steam and mobile, so that was pretty deflating. And that feeling goes double for Babylon's Fall, which was revealed to be a live service game, so into the trash it goes. Not even Platinum developed combat can make me care anymore. Then the show closed off with a fucking weird reveal of Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, a Final Fantasy Souls-like developed by Team Ninja. It just had a guy named Jack who looks like William from Neo, but with a shaved head saying chaos over and over. And then the demo was supposed to be out right after, but apparently the game files were fucked up and wouldn't even start. So everything about this reveal was just a disaster. Completely in spite of the idea of a Souls-like Final Fantasy sounding super cool. Speaking of Final Fantasy, 16 was notably absent, and I think I know why. It's probably going to be shown at the unannounced but inevitable Sony Showcase, which wouldn't surprise me. In fact, I expected it because Square Enix has a very stupid habit of kneecapping their own press conferences to bolster Sony's. That pretty much concludes day two for me, and I know there was a PC gaming show, but I skipped it, just like I skipped every PC gaming show after the first one, because the first one was just that boring and it seems like nothing has really changed on that front since. I know that's probably unfair to any of the games that might have actually looked really good in that show, but I just don't like the format. There's just too much fluff. Then we head over to Day 3, where the only thing I watched was Capcom's show, because I hoped for at least one interesting new thing to appear, specifically a teaser for Dragon's Dogma 2, which I know deep in my heart is in development, but it didn't happen. We got the Resident Evil team thanking us for liking Village, which is a great game, and then announcing through a voiceless text card that it will be receiving DLC by popular demand. Maybe we should demand that Resident Evil 3 Remake as a director's cut that restores more content from the original game. After that, there was a ton of screen time for Monster Hunter and Ace Attorney, and esports stuff that wasn't a tease of a new fighting game or a reveal of the final Season 5 character of Street Fighter V, so I don't give a shit. Then we head into Day 4, which kicked off with Nintendo, also giving a good show, thank god. Kazuya Mishima is coming to Smash, Metroid motherfucking Dread was announced and it looks sick as hell, we got Shin Megami Tensei 5 gameplay featuring its Twink Pro tag that'll take the Yaoi Dojin market by storm, I'm sure. Fatal Frame Maiden of Black Water is getting a port to Switch, and PS5 and Xbox Series, by the way. Goddamn Mushihime-sama is out on the eShop right now with Espgaluga 2 and Dodonpachi Resurrection coming later this year. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity DLC was revealed and Breath of the Wild 2 was shown off. Admittedly, all of this still wasn't super relevant to me personally because I still don't own a Switch. Because I always said that I would get one when Bayonetta 3 got a release date, 
And guess which game wasn't in this show? Ha ha, fuck me, three and a half years and counting. Still a good show though, genuinely. And then the follow-up to that good show was Bandai Namco, who failed to make it clear that theirs was entirely about the Dark Pictures anthology House of Ashes, so a lot of disappointed and confused people tuned in. Awesome. And that pretty much concludes E3 2021, an abysmal showing with only a few glimmers of enjoyment. For the Expo's anticipated return after having last year off, I'm sure most people were expecting more than this. It'll probably lead to some viewers asking for the industry to return to last year's format of companies just doing events when they want, but I don't think that matters all that much. I'll be frank here, I didn't enjoy last year's scattered summer of events any more than I enjoyed a normal E3. The biggest reason why this E3 was such a wash isn't because of E3's existence or structure. I was disappointed with plenty of shows last year too. It's because these companies just had nothing to show, and that likely wouldn't have changed even if they had the choice of doing their own show two months from now. Honestly, I still do prefer keeping E3 around because I just lean towards the tidier organization of it. I would rather be disappointed for one weekend as opposed to 20 days scattered across the entire summer. The quality of the event depends solely on whether or not publishers or platform holders have any interesting cards to play. And this year, they mostly didn't. But e 3 season has a massive concentration of viewers and headlines, so they feel compelled to do something. Funnily enough though, the events in the lead-up to E3 in the couple of weeks prior were actually pretty good. The Dragon Quest 35th Anniversary show was pretty solid, and had some nice surprises for fans of the series. Like an HD 2D remake of DQ3, boasting the beautiful art style similar to Octopath Traveler. Unfortunately, one of those surprises was not a localization of Dragon Quest X, which is basically never going to happen at this point. But we got the reveal of Dragon Quest XII, The Flames of Fate, which has a rad as hell logo design and is confirmed to have moral choices the player will make as they progress. Pretty cool. Sonic Central was also okay, announcing Sonic Colors Ultimate and giving a sneak peek at the next game. Then there were a couple of shows for specific games, namely Dying Light 2 gameplay and the reveal of Battlefield 2042, both of which left pretty good first impressions. And then it all gets topped off with the Summer Game Fest kickoff show hosted by the one and only Jeff the Big Dealy Keely, where we were showed Metal Slug Tactics, which is a game I didn't know I wanted until I saw it, Death Stranding Director's Cut with an amusing interview with Kojima where he says he's tired of making predictions about the future of society because they come true too quickly, and a sizzle reel for a new publishing company, Prime Matter, announcing that they're also publishing Payday 3, Gungrave Gore, and a new painkiller game which is super cool to me. We got new gameplay footage of Tales of Arise and Evil Dead the game, and the show closed out with the big reveal of Elden Ring gameplay which looks exactly like the open-world Souls game you probably imagined, which is good. A couple of the best E3 shows were ones that weren't even part of E3. There were some flashes of brilliance, sure, but not enough to save the majority from being so bland and sometimes actively bad. Not every E3 is going to be a gigantic success, I know, but this was definitely one of the worst ones in a while. I don't know when Sony's next showcase is going to be, I'm sure it's reasonably close, probably at the end of June, if not the beginning of July. But their absence was definitely felt during this event. Not that it's a guarantee that they would blow everyone away, but I feel like they typically have the best showing on a year-to-year -year basis. I guess we'll have to wait and see if that holds up in 2021 as well. This concludes my review of E3 2021. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.